Okay. Welcome to the climate change webinar. We're going to be talking about climate change and the impact on women's mental health. This is the fifth webinar sponsored by the Women's Mental Health Section of the World Federation for Mental Health. My name is Ricky Kantrowitz, and I will be the moderator today. We have some general housekeeping issues first. Please keep yourself muted except when asking questions. The webinar will be recorded. In fact, I think the recording is on now. It will be posted on the WFMH website in the news section. Um, and you can see the, the link here. Um, you can go to the general website and, and find it as well. And we'd like you to just type into the chat where you reside. You can even type what time it is in the day or even what day it is, because for some of us it's early in the morning and some of us it's later in the day. This is the webinar coordinating committee. And I, I think it's really striking to see uh, where everyone is from. Uh, Julie from Australia, Ingrid from South Africa, Nancy from the United States, Porsche from Singapore, Tracy from Canada and myself from the United States. So in fact, we have quite a variety of folks here um, from around the world. Um, has Nancy been able to get in yet? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Great. Okay, so let me just review the agenda. Um, and so Nancy Wallace, the chair of the Women's Mental Health Section will do some greetings. We will have three guest speakers and then a singer. There'll be a question and answer period, closing comments from Ingrid Daniels, the immediate past president of WFMH. The webinar will last 90 minutes. Okay, Nancy, go ahead. Let me stop my share. Yes, I just would like to welcome everybody to, the, to our women's uh, mental health section of the World Federation for Mental Health. This topic of climate and mental health is an extraordinarily important topic. And I'm so pleased that we are being able to present this program to everyone today. I wanna to thank the Women's uh, Webinar uh, Committee for putting together this terrific program. And I encourage those uh, participants that have not considered joining World Federation for Mental Health and our women's section uh, will be providing information at the end of the program. And we hope that you'll all come to join us and participate in the wonderful work of promoting and prevention of mental health throughout the world, especially for women and girls. Thank you so much. Ricky? Okay, um, before I uh, start our first introduction, I just want you to be sure to check the chat where we have people from Pakistan, Taiwan, India, uh, South Africa, and it is um, quite an interesting list, quite an impressive list. So take a, take a, a, some, a moment as, you're, as I'm doing some introductions to, to look at that list. Okay, so let us begin. And we will start with Dr. Connie Gann, a planetary health researcher and lecturer at Griffith University Center for Environment and Population Health based in Brisbane, Australia. Her research attempts to shift the current healthcare paradigm from sick care to preventive, focuses on practical strategy development and commits to producing scholarship that promotes sustainability. In her role as a sustainability coordinator of the Health Promoting Hospital and Environmental Task Force and the Asia Pacific focal point of the Women Leaders for Planetary Health Network. She loves good conversations and leverages innovative ways to accelerate climate action to protect our health and the health of the planet. Okay, Connie. Thank you, Ricky. Can you hear me and see my slides okay? Yes. Thank you very much. So my first question, are you okay today? Or um, are you really okay? For the past two weeks, for the past month or past two years, are you okay? So this is a charity, a national charity um, that are based in Australia. Um, let me, sorry, I can't see 
not okay right now. Take, please take a deep breath while I sort this out. <laughs> um, you can see I'm very super nervous and 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 uh, wait, wait, stop sharing. Okay. Ah, sorry. One more time. Now it's okay. Thank you. So Are You Okay is a national suicide prevention charity that inspires and empower everyone to have meaningful connect, uh, connection with people around them and start a conversation with those in their world who may be struggling with life. So today I would like to start a conversation. So um, how do you feel today? Is it sleepy, tired, uh, anxiety, excited, angry, furious? Uh, or just meh, you know, or, or you, you're intrigued, you want to more learn more or know more about. And it's very, it's uh, what, how do you feel? So please put in the chat one, two, three, four, five, or it's a combination of all big feelings right now. So I would like to also begin by acknowledging the traditional custodian of the land, pay my respect and gratitude to the past, present and future. And I want to learn to restore care for our land and mother earth and the place we call home. So we knew that the mental health continuum is not an exact point. So we have a, a range from healthy coping until the mental uh, ill. How are you today? Are you excelling? Are you thriving? Are you just surviving or struggling or you're in crisis? So we know that mood will go up and down sometimes from day by day or weeks by weeks or months by months. It's, but it's different from climate change. Climate change is different from weather change. Climate change is a period of time that we observe different weather patterns that are making the world or other earth processes having some consequences in, in some of our uh, uh, life supporting system. So it's maybe you, uh, there's this a lot of research and evidence are showing increasing impacts. It's just uh, increased by increased 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. We see more people or a population that will be exposed to water scarcity, more extreme hot days, more uh, intensified storms and different kinds of disasters. So climate change is actually, it's not just a distant polar bear issue. It's already it's very close to us that we see every day. So today I just received a flood warning uh, for the precipitations like rains happening these few days. And we just came out from a record breaking floods in Brisbane. So floods or storms from severe kinds of uh, weather, uh, weather, extreme weather events. It's not just something that are far beyond that we can't imagine. It's already very tangible. And these are very worrying for us. So what is the consequences for health and what climate change impacts on mental health? So research has been identified some of the climate related causes, of course, increased frequency of severity of rains, hurricanes, floodings, and we can see more droughts and wildfire and extreme temperature that are more precedented, uh, increased decrease of food and water security, and we see melting uh, preforest and sea level rise and also this gradual warming of heat. And we also observe a lot of possible health effects uh, due to these climate related causes. Of course, PTSD, anxiety of, uh, after the events or, uh, and also stress and other, this, the long whole list that are, that are caused by uh, climate related uh, disasters or events. But not all people are experiencing this impact equally. We have different pathways that are much, uh, make people, uh, certain groups of people are much more vulnerable. And some climate sensitive health risks or health impacts are adding layer by layer up and make it uh, health impact and health risks are more amplified. So there's the research saying that sometimes you don't need to experience an, a flood or a disaster. You have indirect impacts of exposure to climate hazards. So in 2017, this study is showing that psychological effects were highest among respondents directly affected by flooding, with PTSD being the most commonly reported impact followed by anxiety and depression. However, there's those who are not disrupted by flood 
uh, there are whoever not directly experienced flooding also experienced PTSD, anxiety, and depression related to flood event. So we can see from a public health point of view, we look at the determinants of mental health and intersectionality. So we have social determinants of health, ecological determinants of health, and of course the hazards. And combination of all these interlinked causes uh, and factors and drivers, we, we have seen mental health outcomes that are, uh, some uh, that are on the slides showing. And of course, because these are so precedented and serious and severe consequences, we have uh, policy and strategies are in place uh, to hoping to address this problem. Uh, some of the influencing factor, uh, of course, improving healthcare uh, access, better communication and outreach, healthcare training, sense of community. Uh, we want to build more social capital, uh, emphasizing in mental health literacy like this webinar. And also uh, having more effective and systematic vulnerable, uh, vulnerability ad and adaptation assessment. And of course, uh, bridging intersectional collaborations, building up community preparedness and cultural with uh, the cultural relevancy in mind. So of course, in this, uh, we don't. I don't have to preach uh, and also convince you that all are this interlink and gender and sex and different intersectional sectionality perspective is so important. Sometimes give us opportunity and leverage to plan and design our adaptation and measures to help address the problem. And we know that our climate impacts is not uh, even uh, throughout the whole country. The countries that are producing much more emissions, like the up level, up uh, figure showing the size is a bit awkward and skewed because it's based on the cumulative emissions by country. But on the other hand, on the bottom of the map, world map, we see climate related mortality by country. They are also skewed and it's, it's a bit weird. It's not our uh, normal world map seeing. That is because these are the sites are going according to the climate related mortality by country. So climate impacts, although climate change is a global issue, but it's always have different disproportionate uh, and also uneven distribution in terms of risks and also impacts. So some populations are at, at a greater risk to mental health effects of climate change. And evidence suggests that women tend to be more prone to anxiety, worry, and PTSD related to changing climate. So in particular, women tend to be more be in caregiving roles. Uh, this is why and which are typically undervalued and underpaid. And in these roles, women are at greater risk of experiencing uh, com compassion fatigue, particularly during periods of exposure to climate hazards. So in when we talk about climate change or climate dis created disasters or climate impacts, it's already not an if question, it's a when question. Um, and in my work, we try to look at a broader um, perspective. So when a flower doesn't bloom, we fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. So it's not just that person or that victim or the survivor itself that we want them to stand up. You are strong, you are tough, but how do we build a healthy and supportive infrastructure and community and also environment to support them? So um, I would like to propose also how we uh, try and attempt to address this issue uh, in four different perspectives. First, we try to reduce disparity and pay attention to populations of concern. So in my work with the WHO Kobe uh, and also collaboration with some countries, colleagues and scholars, we try to understand what are the health impacts of climate related disaster and who are the vulnerable populations? What are the health impacts they are facing? So in terms of uh, all the literature and telling us more than 10,000 uh, including English and also the local language published uh, uh, literature showing us women, uh, the underprivileged, uh, elderly, people living with disability are the most vulnerable populations. And we also see some of the disaster are, are more researched than others. And we can also see some area are also uh, being reviewed that are more prone to climate related disasters. So this work is also uh, help us inform where and 
which areas should be prioritized in terms of policy and also resources. Um, in the past two, uh, maybe more years of when the COVID started, we also look at in China, what are the gender impacts uh, under this health emergency. It's not just the virus itself, the measures that are in place, the lockdown, uh, the travel restrictions, uh, the unemployment. So these types of indirect or direct impacts uh, because of pandemic or disaster or climate induced events, uh, what are the gender impacts? So we are trying to um, set up a real time monitoring system and or surveillance to help uh, inform the policy and also strategy. So uh, right now, these are still ongoing research that we, we, we want to learn from the NGO at the local level, how do they pivot themselves uh, during this pandemic, especially when you have a lockdown, uh, the violence against women's or domestic violence, how would you uh, try to also uh, help or some people would need help how can we arrange shelter or refer uh, some services for them? So for example, in Wuhan, one of the teachers was telling me that they have this virtual uh, conversation with the parents and they try to detect if the children are in, in harm or the women's or the mother at, at home are in harm, uh, is at risk uh, and they can signal uh, and call for help. So it's a lot of the pivoting and also the NGO trying creatively to help um, uh, to address this problem. So number two, we want to also try to access and expand community mental health infrastructure. So during a, a disaster, for example, a flood, a lot of NGO or, or government will just jump in and they will try to provide supplies like rice or cooking oil uh, or blankets. But a lot of time we, we overlook or we forgot the mental health infrastructures that are needed uh, in place. So this is uh, the case in Malaysia. We have a very serious flood uh, in the uh, last end of uh, December, early January. Um, and this organization observed that uh, it's very close to Chinese New Year and a lot of the Chinese family, like Buddha statue and also our ancestor are being worshiped at home. So during the flood, these are all being damaged. And these are all the mental health infrastructure. It's a very strong, important, critical pillar for a faith-based community. So they try to not just give them uh, rice or cooking oil or blankets. They try to restore and help them to gather some resources to help them to have uh, their faith uh, worship uh, places and venue. For them to have a place to pray or for them to have people to get gathered together and have conversation together. So how do we build this mental health infrastructure uh, that are so important and sometimes always like overlook. So this is also the picture that you can see some some houses have maybe five, 10 NGOs coming in and giving the same thing. So they have like a tons of, and so like, you know, piling up of rice and cooking oil, but they can't cook. They don't have uh, electricity or gas. So what are the, the essential resources that are needed at that critical time? It's, we, re we really need to rethink uh, of this. So this is also another piece of research that we look at also the national level. How are the policy being mapped in terms of uh, climate re related disaster? We often see there are, there, there are so limited or thin literature or policy in investing in mental health uh, promotion or preventions. Often it's just suicide prevention. So it's not the prevention or the upstream level of uh, mental health promotion. So number four, we, we try to also engage and empower community members on how to respond. So this is also a co collaboration and partnership with the Malaysian government after uh, the flood events. And that is always important. Sometimes we are too busy to go in to, uh, to rescue and just jump to, a, to, that, to another or the next uh, uh, disaster. So this is the time uh, we invite 250 participants representing 100 NGO to, to, to virtually discuss what are the lessons learned and what can we do better. So a question that we asked the participant, how many of you know how to swim? And the answer is very shocking because it's just one third of them know how to swim. 
And a lot of people will say we have very kind-hearted and passionate uh, volunteerism spirit, and we want to help our community. But how do we effectively help them? So what are the, how do we care for ourselves first before we care for others? So all these are being discussed and it's, it's very um, important that we involve the relevant stakeholders, including not just the grassroots up until the national level. So the, the minister is uh, engaged and uh, participating in this uh, program. And also we have cross-cultural, uh, cross-national lessons learned uh, platform to empower community. And this also one very sweet, I think, example during the Brisbane uh, flood, uh, some condominium or uh, uh, high building, the elevator was not working. And this was my colleague and she, she lived in 22nd floor. And the, the, then you can imagine that she has to, you know, go up the stairs and they have this th stairs and angel to put uh, chairs uh, in each level and, and do some tiny little uh, messages and say, life is tough, but so are you. Uh, and they have some food and dessert in some levels. And so these are, you know, like how do we um, make creative interventions? It's just listening and uh, participating in meaningful and engaged conversation with each other. So in about how climate change hurts or kills us, it's about what we do to each other. So this is the main message when we ask people, are, are you okay? You know, We really want to make time for the person and think outside how our infrastructure and the surrounding environment support them. So um, it's my, uh, I'm grateful and privileged to share the screen with all this amazing and <laughs> so uh, fantastic, wonderful, uh, people in this mental health promotions. And uh, I, I thank you for your attention and welcome any questions and comments. Thank you so much. Thank you, Connie. And um, we will have questions at the end of all of our speakers, just so you'll know. Um, okay. And I'm just going to get up the slides for our next speaker who asked me to... Uh, to get them up, so let me do that. Okay, um, are you able to see that? Yes, okay, so. All right, then let me introduce Kriti. Dr. Kriti Vashist identifies as an educator and practitioner in the field of global mental health. She is the US representative to the Global Mental Health Peer Network. She is currently working as an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at McNeese State University in Louisiana. Her work is largely shaped by her interest in human rights, participatory approaches and intersectionality of mental health to justice and social issues. Her recent work is focused on mental health, stigma, LGBTQ advocacy, and intersection of women's justice issues and mental health. So, Kriti. Uh, yes. Um, all right, let me- Thank you um, so much. Yes. Am I on? You are. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, hello to everyone. Um, I am very delighted to be part of such a critical platform because we are talking about climate change and how it intersects with the most vulnerable population, including women. Uh, I will be sharing my experiences, which is limited to my privilege and my oppressive um, experiences. Uh, so um, be mindful of uh, that that I'm just sharing my experience. Uh, there are uh, other vulnerable population and experience that we need to be uh, included um, in this critical talk. Uh, like um, Ricky mentioned, my name is Dr. Kriti Vashish. I am a proud member of Global Mental Health Peer Network who gives uh, and provides space to people with lived experiences. Um, and I am delighted to be presenting here. Can we move to the second slide, please? 
before before moving on to the lived experiences i just wanted to contextualize and what is climate change and connie has done a wonderful job doing that but little in brief that climate change is related to uh, increase in extreme weathers uh, due to rise in uh, greenhouse effects and gases uh, in the atmosphere these extreme weathers uh, can be um, visible uh, for example, through um, extreme heat waves uh, that's experienced in India and in the US both, and maybe in the entire country, um, hurricane storms, uh, tornadoes, etc., flooding, um, water stress level, etc., and how these extreme weathers intersects with the social, cultural, and political issues, including um, gender issues, domestic violence, food security, um, mental health and other physical um, effects is, is going to be my uh, lived experience. Uh, I will be focusing more on air pollution and how that affects uh, physical and mental health and how hurricanes and um, uh, industrial population uh, pollution results in mental health and physical uh, health concern in Louisiana and in India. Can we move to the third slide, please? Okay, so um, this uh, slide is about my lived experience of climate change in, in India and the US. The first story is based on my life event that occurred in 2013 um, in the capital city of India, Delhi. So the very first picture is, um, is, is a city which is very near to my heart, uh, where I was born and brought up in uh, Delhi. And Delhi is, um, as you can see visibly, that the air quality is not very um, clear uh, in Delhi. And we have extreme uh, issues of air uh, pollution and uh, increase in lethal particles in air in Delhi. Uh, the second picture is of um, my apartment and I lost everything in that hurricane that happened in Louisiana uh, in the US after I moved uh, for my first job from Texas uh, to the city uh, which is full of lakes uh, in Louisiana. So my uh, lived experience will involve uh, these two cities. Um, if you see me looking at this side, so I'm looking at my notes. So about the very first picture, I would like to share that um, in 2019, yeah, one second, yeah. In 2019, uh, there was a public health emergency in India, basically in Delhi. Uh, schools were closed, people stayed at home, uh, constructions were stopped, and roads were nearly deserted. Even the international flights and the domestic flights were diverted from the city of Delhi. And the reason behind that was uh, it was noticed uh, and it was uh, announced that uh, the, there are some lethal particles present in the breathing air uh, in Delhi that no one can go out and breathe that air because they're, they're, then there will be a risk of um, death and lung cancer and maybe having some other severe physical health concerns. Um, if you if you go out in Delhi, so that was the critical issue that we uh, dealt with. Now the question arises: uh, why uh, why there is uh, so much of air pollution in Delhi? Um, I think the major reason is urbanization. When you talk about urbanization and modernization, then there is a risk of over overpopulation, overburden of resources, over usage of resources, over. Um, usage of vehicles in the city, uh, crop burning, um, cultural events like Diwali, a festival where we uh, burst crackers, all resulted in uh, severe air pollution in Delhi. Um, uh, and in the second picture, I will be talking about the hurricane and I'll take that um, a little later. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. So why I talked about uh, air po pollution and Delhi, um, I will try to, you know, contextualize it, that air, it's not, uh, so climate change and air pollution is not limited 
to just a, a social and the political issue for me. It has been something that I have lived uh, through. Uh, it was later in my life I realized that how um, climate change, air pollution intersect with my intersected with my life. So I remember I was a young graduate, um, uh, graduated from a master's degree in psychology, wanted to work in policy research. So I was doing, uh, I was given a task of uh, designing a participatory survey to um, assess the health literacy related to tuberculosis in a rural area in India. So I was, I remember making stick figures uh, with a uh, cough, um, maybe vomiting blood out of them using hankies and tissues to you know cover them and I was thinking uh, that was the first time uh, I uh, read to about tuberculosis and I was thinking that you know why someone would uh, go through such a severe symptom what are the reasons behind that so I remember googling it uh, you know you how you look for uh, every information on google uh, I remember uh, Googling uh, uh, tuberculosis and the reasons behind that. And the first thing that I read was that how it is uh, related to a uh, low socioeconomic background and how if there is, um, a, you know, less, uh, if you are not getting proper nutrition, food, how TB is something which is common in the rural and low socioeconomic background in India. So I thought to myself, okay, I belong to middle class family. I don't think that TB is something that will ever happen to my family, but you know, poor and sad for families who struggle with it. Uh, after one month, when I was in a field work, um, on the same project, I got a call from my mother and she told me that she was diagnosed with tuberculosis. And then I thought about um, uh, that, to my knowledge, tuberculosis was something which could never happen to me or to my mother or to my family. How come my mother had that um, uh, issue? Um, and she was, uh, it was told to me that she's diabetic, she has low immune system, uh, and that is why she got um, severe pneumonia, which got uh, misdiagnosed, and now she is struggling with tuberculosis. So it was, uh, which is uh, tuberculosis, uh, by the way, it's uh, lung-related uh, disease. So it was not only the physical ailment uh, that impacted us as a family, because, but we all come from a very traditional family in India. So my the role of my mother was to take care of every single chore in the household. So she used to make sure that she's uh, cooking food for us, doing laundries for us, doing dishes for us, taking care of uh, you know our uh, basic necessities so that we can go to work and maybe focus more on our physical and mental health, maybe join gym. Uh, my father was health freak and social um, bird. Uh, and I think my uh, traditional role of my, my, my mother definitely gave him a little free spirit that he could enjoy those areas. Uh, so, uh, but when she was diagnosed with tuberculosis, it was so natural that me being the second eldest um, woman in the family that I had to take that role. Uh, as a 23 year, old, 23 year old, I wasn't ready for that role at all. And who was preparing and was very career motivated. I wanted to go for PhD to the US. I was not ready for that uh, kitchen uh, duties for 24 hours. And I was not that mature enough to have that conversation with my father that, you know, the Job, the roles and responsibility of this household needs to be negotiated. Um, uh, and uh, in the background, I was struggling with, you know, uh, my mother being severely ill, severely weak, and I had to cook food for her and taking care of herself. So I, the very first thing that I did as a woman was uh, resigning from my job so that I can take care of my mother and take care of my career and focus more on maybe preparing for PhD and give time to my uh, family. Uh, and what are the other changes that happened in the family dynamics were my I saw that how my mother started having a little uh, mental health uh, symptoms uh, she's doing uh, fine and well she's happy now but at that time she start I think she was uh, having anxiety and depression symptom and she start, used to start doing the household work because that was that was the only thing she did for 
all her life. So she start, she used to start doing the household chores to feel good about herself, even if she wasn't ready for that. So that was not very um, positive and very um, healthy for us as a family to see. Uh, uh, when we were focusing on her medication um, and her uh, her medication and her health, tuberculosis requires a lot of uh, good uh, nutritious food. So definitely there was a fa financial burden on my on my family because now I wasn't earning and it was only my father taking care of the family. Um, uh, beside this, um, I uh, talked about how mental health was a part of my daily struggle and also my younger sister because she was a high school student and um, she was not sure how she can take care of me my family my mother and my father at that time so definitely that had severe impact on her um, on her mental health as well so um, after that struggle um, and how we revived as a family, we were supportive. We had our share, fair share of uh, struggles during the tuberculosis and my mo mother's physical health. Um, what happened later on was um, I have realized that how my mother now have a long lasting impact on the cardiovascular and respiratory issues. She, she struggles with it. Now, when I have moved to the US and it's been six years, uh, you would not even imagine that I never turn off my Wi-Fi. I never put my phone on silent because I live in constant fear that I will get a call from my uh, father that my mother is not feeling well. Um, uh, and COVID definitely added um, to that life story because um, COVID was um, effect affecting people respiratory and lung lungs uh, a lot and my mother being severely um ill i was majority majorly concerned about her uh then i have talked about the mobility issue um as a family when we realize that you know it's it's the you know the delhi air is so polluted that you know even if uh, my mother is uh, doing fine now, we have to make a move to a different city in India, but it's not easy. Uh, my father and uh, I have been convincing my mother and my family members to move to a different city, but it's not easy. Why? Because it is difficult for someone to uproot uh, themselves from one city and move to another city where they have um, no one, no family um, and no social belonging. So I think uh, I know that my my mother is never going to leave Delhi. And I think that's the saddest part, um, uh, you know, how you because she always struggled with fear of losing the personal, social and cultural connection. And definitely it's a financial burden on a daily basis. Why is that? Because um, in Indian currency, my family spent 6,000 to 10,000 rupees uh, daily uh, on, on a monthly basis for her, um, for her medication. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a story of my mother, but that's the story of uh, all the Delhiites who live in that toxic air on a daily basis. Um, can we move to the another start slide? Okay, just trying to find my uh, mouse. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no problem. Um, and then um, after my um, experience uh, in nutshell in India and uh, related to Delhi and air pollution and my mother' physical and mental health, I would like to move to. Um, to uh, the US experience. Um, and I think my um, why climate change and intersectionality of social and cultural and political issues uh, related to mental health is, um, is, is in heart, is in my heart and is, is my passion because I have experienced that. Um, so uh, as, um, as a doctoral candidate, uh, as a doctoral student, I never explored the US a lot uh, until I was going for the conferences because the coursework was hectic um, and financially also it, you do not have a lot of freedom to explore the US. So uh, after getting a job in Louisiana, my first job, I was very excited to move to a new city and exploring um, 
the US, uh, but to my surprise, uh, I moved uh, to Louisiana in January 2020, and uh, then we got hit by COVID. Uh, so, uh, and I was restricted to my new apartment. That was uh, that was something that I was setting up. Um, and 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 then uh, in August 2020. Um, the city that I used to live in, uh, Lake Charles, um, was hit by two hurricanes, uh, Laura, Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Ida. Um, and then I saw that how the the reason behind climate change and the criticality of you know talking about climate change is important for people who are living in the in the climate change prone areas. So when Louisiana was hit by two hurricanes and Lake Charles was hit by two hurricanes, I lost almost every single item. I um, I bought in, to decorate my new house uh, and everything that even I bought from India. Uh, so that was definitely something which I wasn't ready for. That was definitely a huge financial burden, but it added to the mental health stress that I had struggled uh, for one year because I was displaced. Uh, I And US being a foreign country, I didn't know where to go to. Um, I do not even have a family members in the US. So uh, the only city that I could go to was uh, the city where I did uh, my PhD from because that I was familiar with only that city. So I went there and uh, lived with a friend uh, for six months, sharing the space uh, with her wasn't the pleasant thing. Um, on uh, on top of losing everything you owned and then uh, organizing your career as a woman as well. So that was my struggle with a uh, hurricane um, in um, Louisiana. And then I saw that uh, you know, I started uh, looking and collecting stories related to that, how hurricane not only affected me, I was still a privileged person who was able to teach in the university and earn a decent amount of money to survive myself. But then there were people who lost their houses. There were people who uh, did not have enough uh, to survive themselves, who are still living uh, and are homeless uh, in Lake Charles uh, because we did not get a lot of uh, financial assistance from the government uh, as well. Louisiana has um, a different historical uh, history with, uh, with the government uh, in terms of financial aid. So that was something that I also noticed. And I noticed how, um, if you are a woman uh, who are who is struggling, you know, who are pregnant or struggling with postpartum depression, how adding responsibility of getting the contractor to construct the house is still on after two years of uh, being hit by Hurricane uh, Laura and Ida. So it's a constant struggle. And uh, on a daily basis, I see those lived experiences and new narratives uh, from the grassroots level uh, related to climate change. I also noticed that um, how the prevalence and increase in our oil industries and refineries around the uh, Louisiana area and Houston, Texas area, how that um, result in increased number of cancer uh, diseases among women. Um, I do not have any personal narrative to share on that, but I do have a secondary narrative that I got from my friend who works at the university with me. She has been, um, you know, she has been living in Lake Charles for, uh, I think, almost all her life. And she was diagnosed with cancer at a very young age. Uh, she have a job, but her, you know, how uh, Medicare and how health insurance uh, sub do not support uh, or ask for extra money if you are a woman and you might have a cancer uh, risk. Uh, so that's another politics that we are going to talk about uh, in uh, later sessions. But uh, how uh, how the oil industries and how the air pollution uh, or the it, or the pollution exhausting from these factories and these refineries are affecting the local people and women and how they struggle with cancer, how they struggle with hurricanes, how they struggle with the financial and regular basis of mental health and uh, physical health concern is something which is very alarming. Um, and it is sad that we still are not able to include those narratives uh, onto the policy work um, 
in the US, which is the most developed uh, nation uh, in the world and the developing countries like India, which is um, which is at the high risk of climate change. Um, uh, climate change. I think um, I would also wait for uh, questions and feedbacks at the end of this presentation. Um, so this is a little snippet of my personal lived experiences related to climate change. Thank you so much. I think that Connie's great foundation and your personal narratives has helped move us forward uh, in this um, webinar. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maria Celeste Delgado Librera. Celeste was born and raised in Spain. She received a university degree in English philology at the Universidad de Sevilla. After moving to uh, the United States, she received a master's and PhD degree in Spanish literature at the University of Virginia. Celeste's professional life has always involved education and languages. She's taught Spanish language and literature at four different colleges in the state of Virginia and at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. For seven years, she directed a study abroad program for the US college students in Seville. She's also a professional translator and interpreter. She published The Mirror of Yelma Rausch and in addition, an English translation of manuscript Van Vatican Library 4806, a canonical text of medieval Catalan literature. In 2019, she founded Sustainable Roanoke, and that brings her to why she's here on this panel, a local grassroots environmental group in Roanoke, Virginia. She currently lives in Florida, working as a freelance translator and online language instructor. And it's my pleasure to turn this over to Celeste. Thank you, Nikki. Hi, and greetings to all of you, fellow human beings from around the globe who are tuning in. Um, I've been invited to share my experiences as a woman who felt the need to go to do something about the environment um, because she was going nuts, which is not a terminology that I'm sure you're um, expecting in this webinar, but it does capture my own perspective of things. So I'm going to share my screen now, but before I'm going to turn off the camera because according to some estimates using audio only, and I teach a lot on Zoom, can reduce your carbon emissions by up to 96%. So let me do that first. And then I will stop video and share my screen. Can you see it? Great. Yes, we can. Thank you. All right, so before I go any further, I want to clarify that like Dr. Kriti Vashisht, I hope I pronounced that well, I have led quite a privileged life, um, but unlike her, I have never suffered any physical harm due to climate change, at least not to my knowledge. And I don't have children, so I don't need to worry about their future. But ever since I learned about climate change for reasons that I do not understand, it has affected me intensely at an emotional level. I became aware of global warming at the beginning of 1988. At the time, I was a shy and insecure university student in Spain, and I had grown disappointed in my field of study, English uh, philology. So I decided to take a break, and I got my first job ever in an area that was completely new to me as an interpreter and nature guide at Doñana National Park. Doñana was and still is a very large natural preserve located at the southern Spanish coast that has a great variety of ecosystems and the greatest biodiversity in Europe. It is especially crucial to the approximately 6 million birds that migrate annually between Africa and Europe. Although it is protected in theory, it has always been under constant threat by agricultural and tourist development. Um, strawberries are big in that area and they, they need to be in greenhouses. Uh, mining pollution is also a problem. And lately, the fact that it's near what has been classified as a strategic gas storage site. So it was there during our training that at age 21, I'm the last person on the right, 
uh, learning how to feel nature with other senses other than sight. So at age 21, I first heard about global warming and the loss of biodiversity that countries from what we now know as the global north were inflicting on the entire planet and especially on poorer countries. I had never heard of it in school or in the news or in political speeches. And frankly, my initial reaction to this new knowledge was pretty much like Greta Thunberg's. How come people are not dropping everything they're doing right now and just putting their bodies on the line to demand change and to save future generations? Why isn't anyone else panicking? But unlike Greta, as you probably suspect, I didn't start a global movement. At first, I did try to tell people around me, my friends and my family, what I had just discovered. But no one seemed to share my sense of urgency. They would argue that if global change, uh, global warming was really a problem, then it would be all over the news. That even if it was a problem, it couldn't be very big because they couldn't see its effects. And that even if it was a big problem for some people, it clearly didn't affect them. So. It didn't clearly affect me, so why would I care? Well, I was sure that global warming was real and caused by the economic system based on extractive capitalism, of which I, and probably all of you, are. Um, I am an active member. I was convinced that eventually it would affect all life on the planet, but I didn't have the knowledge or the skills to persuade anyone else, nor the power to change things. I was led by passion and fear. And all I managed to do when I brought up the topic was get angry, frustrated, alienated from those around me, and depressed. It just didn't go very well for me. So for most of um, the rest of the time, I mostly stopped trying to convince others. I did whatever I could with my own privilege to reduce my own impact. I got a hybrid car, drove as little as possible, reduced my personal consumption, composted, installed a solar system at home, recycled whatever could be recyclable. But I was aware that none, none of this made any significant difference because the problem is systemic and therefore it required a systemic approach that no one who could do anything about it seemed to be interested in. For some, for the, for the next two decades, so I just watched in increasing horror how more and more parts of the world engaged more and more aggressively in a behavior that was going to lead to our common destruction. In 2018, after a period of much personal and professional change in our lives, my husband and I ended up in the city of Roanoke in rural central Virginia. My husband had taken a job at a college and I was unemployed with plenty of time to make myself worry sick. And at that point, the, also the Trump administration was systematically undoing the minimal environmental protections that previous administrations had put in place. I was so concerned, not just about the environment, but also about my sanity, that just to get out of the house, I volunteered for a local candidate for Congress, a woman who ran on a pro-environmental platform. So I started knocking on doors and calling voters on the phone, which is something I never thought I would do in my entire life. I've always been very shy. But my candidate lost, as, a, I was, as was expected in the conservative district that she was hoping to represent. However, unexpectedly, I won because I overcame my shyness. I learned to speak in a calm and reasoned and articulate manner about these issues. And I met dozens of people in my new city and I found a new sense of purpose. Let me tell you a bit about Roanoke. Roanoke is located in the Blue Ridge Mountains of the Eastern United States, and it promotes itself as a green city, something that got me really excited when we first moved there. But soon I discovered that this was just a marketing strategy to attract tourists interested in outdoor activities like hiking or kayaking or cycling. The city itself was just as bad as any other U.S. city in terms of the environment. Lots of paved areas, a dwindling tree canopy, especially in the poorer neighborhoods, a polluted river, um, an inefficient and opaque recycling system, no plastic waste ordinances, 
food deserts, minimal solar investments, limited public transportation, and none of it electric. So basically not green at all. So one day in 2019, I was just uh, moping around the house thinking about all these things. This was less than a year after we arrived in Roanoke. And more or less out of the blue, I created a Facebook group that I called Sustainable Roanoke. I had a vague notion that this could be a platform for members of the community, the people I had just met, to share information about the environment from reliable sources, because that's another big problem, uh, fake information. Ask and answer questions, post tips, start actions targeting local businesses, influence the city council, write letters to the editor, whatever people thought that they wanted to do that was important. So of course, I still had my doubts and fears and I didn't invite anyone for a couple of days because I was afraid that A, no one would be interested or B, lots of people would be interested and then I wouldn't know where to go from there. Well, as it turned out, neither fear was granted because all the friends that I had made during the campaign joined the group and started inviting other friends and for the next few months, Sustainable Roanoke grew organically and steadily. Some time later, I created a rudimentary website. This is a newer version and a mailing list for people who weren't on Facebook, of which apparently there are some, I don't know. A few months later, I'm going fast. Many things happened in between, but I'm going fast. Uh, a few months later, a friend asked me if I wanted to have a tent at a local fair to collect a few items that didn't get recycled locally, but that could be sent to this up and coming company called TerraCycle. What we collected was just minimal, a few broken toys, some spent markers, a couple of ink cartridges, nobody really knew anything about us. But through that event, I got to meet Nikki Del Castillo, my partner in crime. She is, she's a woman who was just, and still is, just as shy and insecure and angry and frustrated and fed up as I was. But somehow our trust in each other counseled our self-doubts and gave us the courage to try to do something about the problems that we saw in the city. Thinking that no matter how many mistakes we made, the worst one would be to do nothing. Fast forward to today. So, Shy of three years since I timidly created the group, Sustainable Roanoke is a completely volunteer-based nonprofit organization coordinated by a five-member board. Our Facebook group has 1,219 members and our mailing list reaches 340 people. We have a recognized um, presence in the city and the county of Roanoke. We have been interviewed by several local TV stations and local publications have written about us. And also all the council members, including the mayor and the vice mayor, as well as, as our state delegate, are members of our Facebook group. They don't necessarily interact all the time, but they are aware of what we're doing. Through posts, group members have shared information that have, has led many of them to opt for more su sustainable al alternatives, sorry. Uh, for example, many of them have started making their own cleaning products or yogurt or reduced their meat or dairy consumption. They have looked into installing sol solar panels, et cetera. Despite the pandemic, which forced us to limit our in-person activities, we have managed to organize several cleanups this is, and brand audits to figure out who the biggest polluter in our area are. We have also organized a climate strike in support of Fridays for Future and two visits to the local sorting facility, which then distributes the recycling to other facilities, where we learned that most of what we think is recycled is actually sent to the landfill. And this is not special to Roanoke. This is happening all over the world. We have also started a series of pop-up refill stations. This is very recent as of a few months ago in collaboration with local businesses where we sell cleaning products in bulk to people who bring their own reusable containers. So we are reducing the, their use of plastic 
But what we are most famous for is our recycling events, of which so far we have organized 22 that have been growing steadily. I'll give you the details uh, for our last one. Oh, this is also we do a sorting uh, of the um, of all the further sorting of all the materials we collect. These are all our volunteers. Then we send it off to be recycled elsewhere in the United States. So uh, I'll give you the details of our last one on March 19th um, as an example. In three hours, we had 30 volunteers, mostly women, I have to add, who helped approximately 180 people drop off a minimum total of 810 pounds of up to 28 different types of items that would have otherwise for sure ended up in the landfill. And that includes styrofoam, plastic film, plastics numbers, actually two, four, five, and six, tennis balls, shoes, snacks, uh, snack and candy wrappers, plastic, plastic straws, a bunch of things. And we also collected $795 dollars in donations, we are supported exclusively through donations. Um, so this is, uh, this is a photo of our, the last event that I attended because I then moved to Florida. After, um, after, as I said, after each recycling event, we do have these sorting parties and we make sure that everything is categorized properly and sent off. And, and we pay for that with our donations. But the most important impact of all, in my opinion, is not in those numbers that I gave you, which are meaningless compared to all the materials that get trashed or incinerated or scattered all over the planet every single minute. In fact, I know that recycling isn't even part of the solution to climate change, but rather an integral part of our problem of the problem designed for the by the fossil fuel industry. Of course, we need to recycle the materials that have already been produced and that will be produced until our economic system changes. But recycling only lulls people into thinking that they have done enough, that they are doing enough, which doesn't stop them from doing what's truly necessary to have a viable future for all, which is stop generating waste. The most important impact of sustainable Roanoke, in my opinion, is the, uh, the fact that more and more members of the community are coming together around local environmental issues, learning from one another and feeling empowered and taking individual and collective action. And I hope that the same thing is happening at last all over the planet, because I believe that only grassroots actions like ours at a global scale can force politicians and industry leaders, the only ones who can make a difference, to, mit to mitigate, although not stop, unfortunately at this point, the effects of climate change. We can all be Greta. We should all try to be Greta. It's good for the environment and it's good for us. Like Greta, I'm still horrified by what lies ahead. Between 1988 and today, we have wasted much time and things have gotten much, much worse than I could have imagined or feared back then. I continue to not understand why everyone isn't panicking. But in the past three years, working together with Nikki and all the other sustainable Roanoke volunteers, I no longer feel alone or powerless. I know that I am part of the problem, but I'm constantly trying to also be part of the solution so that sustainable Roanoke's vision of the future has a chance so that we can have a clean, safe and healthy environment. I'm sorry, healthy community based on a circular economy that respects and protects people and the natural environment equally. And that is it from me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Celeste, for sharing your story of activism and challenging us and letting us, telling us we can all be activists. We're now going to um, have a treat and hear a song. Um, so we've tried to really have a fully rounded uh, webinar. Uh, this is um, by Kate Oliver. Kate Oliver is an Australian born country and folk artist she sings with the depth and beauty of the Catherine River, the lifeblood of the town she calls home. 
Kate is a traveler making her way all over the outback um, of Australia while working, sharing stories, writing songs, and playing music. From roadworks camps across the Tanami and Plenty Highways to the seaside haven of Newcastle and New South Wales and beyond, if you're lucky, you'll find, find Kate in a bar on a back porch or sitting around a campfire, guitar in hand, ready to regale you with universal tales of love and life, irrevocably intertwined with the feeling of the Australian bush, the bounce of her beloved truck over long and dusty corrugated roads and forming the rhythms of her songs. Kate's rich and earthy voice and nostalgic delivery will take an audience, any audience on a journey through the raw backcountry Kate knows all too well. Kate shared with me the history behind her song, First Lady of the Outback. She wrote, Mom wrote the first part of the song and I did the music. The words were found in a book at the Catherine Museum and were handed to me by the mayor at the time. So now we'll hear First Lady of the Outback. Have you ever been to Catherine? Discovered its many jewels. Have you ever been to Catherine? Where the Catherine River she wants through? Or stood deep in Katakata Kaya. Crystals shimmering bright Who boated the many gorges With their rocky faced heights It's where luscious green places red It's where the ancient palms still grows A little north of the turning point the Catherine River flows Her water's sweet and her path is bold and awesome Gorge her track Nearby the town that bears her name First Lady of the Outback Territory, it's the great outback. There's no place more Australian. She'll keep you coming back. Her water's sweet and her path is bold and awesome. Gorge her track. Nearby the town that bears her name. First Lady of the Thank you. Um, uh, it's a powerful song with a very scary message at the end about environmental degradation that could be taking place. So uh, thank you, Kate. I think that she said that she was going to try to join us. Um, so thank you. We do have about 10 or 11 minutes for uh, questions and answers before we have our wrap up. So um, I guess that I'm gonna ask you, please, um, I don't know if anybody on the panel has comments or questions, but if anybody uh, in the audience does, you can please uh, write it in chat and I will ask the questions. So any panelists wanna make further comments while we're waiting for any questions?
I can definitely share that how well organized it was. Um, I really liked how you have collaborated with different speakers and how they are um, coming with their content. So I loved it. Um, I hope to see more of these sort of uh, events in the future. So thank you. We've had Thank a comment you, from, sorry, we had a comment from um, Jane L. Chen saying, now a day in Taiwan, there are many local groups do the keep our sea and island clean for generations. Many are women and community retirees. Thank you, Jane. I think Celeste, uh, you were gonna say something. Well, I was, I was going to thank Nancy for her comment. And also, now that you mentioned that, Julie, um, I would say that 90% of the people involved with Sustainable Roanoke are women on a regular basis. So probably 90, 95%. It's just unbelievable. Maybe that's the reason why we call Mother Earth. It's not Father Earth. <laughs> Connie, can you speak a little bit more about the research that you're involved in and what you're working on now uh, on this topic? Oh, thank you. Um, I hope I didn't sound too nerdy in my presentation with uh, bombasted and blast all the evidence <laughs> and the data. Um, and of course, like as a climate change and health scientist, we need to really learn, like uh, Celestis, you were saying, how do we communicate and advocate uh, and mobilize everyone to this movement uh, and join hands together. So for me as a lecturer, actually, I teach environment and population health. And before this, I just finished my three hours lecture talking about water and land use change um, and climate change. Um, of course, I, I, I see our future in good hands. I hope my, I, my students and everyone can, uh, you know, be part of it because we inherit so beautiful world and I hope my generations to come can also experience and see the beautiful world as I do. Um, so my research is also part of the Asia Pacific uh, Women's Leaders for Planetary Health. We hope to invite different discipline. Like this is a really good platform. We share the screens from different time zones and geographical regions. You have your own priority in terms of climate change. And you, you are also have the resources and uh, innovative, creative strategies that you can put in place, uh, not just an individual level, uh, at a community level. And how do we be more vocal uh, in advocating for change? And always women has the power. <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's very magical. Sometimes I see my colleagues around the world uh, that are putting this in place. So for research, there are two parts of it. One is we are collecting some of the case study uh, at the grass, grassroots level, how gender-based organizations, uh, also NGOs, are taking part in this climate solutions, climate actions, and how do we take care of those uh, vulnerable or subpopulation in need. Um, and we are trying to learn from each other some of the good practices that are uh, being in place, implemented, and how can we also replicate in another context or in other regions. Um, and some research are also doing in, in China, specifically, we, we look at health emergency and some of the measures, uh, real-time documenting uh, some lessons learned that we, we don't want. We know that pandemic is not a what-if question, like I say. So the next pandemic is maybe it's just uh, around the corner. Um, it's, it's sad to say, but we need to really be ahead of disaster. Um, like we, we learn, we, we hear so much so sad negative consequences and stories that we really want to prevent it. Um, yeah, but uh, yes. Well, certainly uh, in uh, Oceania region, um, climate change is having a uh, detrimental effect on people living in island nations. And uh, we're seeing a lot of um, impact of rising floodwaters, but also to, um, you know, earthquakes and, and tsunamis and uh, massive change for um, Oceania and, and its uh, peoples.
Preeti, I was wondering if um, when you were speaking about your family's experience in India, um, were there mental health resources available there? And if not, and it sounded maybe not so much, would there have been anything? What would you have wanted to design to be offering? Um, there are mental health uh, services um, in India. However, the stigma, I think the more we are talking about mental health, um, mental health awareness, I think uh, we need to start working on stigma and how the literacy works in mental health area because um, people are not literate enough to even recognize that they have uh, mental health issues. Uh, so at that time, even I had a little bit of experience with psychology and what mental health could look like. I did not reach out to any anyone uh, for that matter or for social support as well. So I think um, it's it's um, the the help is available. However, um, being an overpopulated country, we have our fair share of um, challenges of uh, having um, less mental health practitioners and. Um, professionals who can help the local people. Uh, we do not have a sustainable uh, way of uh, including mental health into the insurance and health insurance that gives rise to the accessibility issue of mental health. Um, there are, there are, mental health is still a concern. There are uh, raising um, resources in the area. However, I think the prime thing that we need to to focus more on is mental health stigma and mental health literacy so that people are ready to even reach out to the mental health um, practitioners. Have you found it different? Is it different in Louisiana around the, um, these storms and things like that? Did you find that people did go and seek in a different way than they might have in India? Um, definitely resources are, um, Resources are here. However, Louisiana uh, have a different context uh, if you compare it with the other metropolitan uh, cities in the US. Uh, the city I live in is a little conservative. Uh, so they struggle a lot with um, LGBT. LGBTQ issues. They, they are not able to see the, the intersectionality of climate change and what they are experiencing, uh, the trauma, the experience is related to, you know, they being not able to have a stable life for two years or three years in a row. So people are not um, literate enough to understand the connection. However, I do see that there are active organizations that are working towards it are uh, a long way to go. Uh, but then people are more, seem to be more open, I guess, uh, and there are resources available. So I think the major differences uh, of resources that there are people working in the area. However, um, the issue is still the same, but the intensity is different for sure. Thank you for the comparison. I wanted to comment on the chat that Connie just uh, wrote that uh, countries that are exploiting resources uh, also have high prevalence on violence against women. And um, I think Nancy, you commented that um, we always have to think about the impact on the well-being and integrated mental health perspective uh, for women and girls. And I think that certainly during the pandemic, they found that violence against women and girls has gone up a great deal. Um, I don't know if any of you, anyone wants to speak more, Connie, if you wanted to speak more about that, about violence against women. Yeah, so this is uh, intertwined pandemics, right? Multiple uh, pandemics that we are facing, not just climate change, then we have the COVID and also uh, violence, domestic violence against women. Um, so I think in, in some of the research that we've done in the past, this during the pandemic, we see increased uh, call for help, uh, but the resources was just all focusing on uh, COVID. But how do we uh, change we, the response that we usually put in place for preventing domestic violence? And, and a lot of the time we are seeing we have the shelter, but the referral system or the reporting system is not there to help uh, the victims or the person who are suffering that are going to get the help or access the help. 
So uh, like, like Sarista was saying, how do we look at the systematic, uh, systemic level of, uh, of the inf uh, infrastructures and environment um, that we need all levels of people involved uh, because every one of you are an entry point to solve the problem, a puzzle that we can just in solidarity to pick and put everything together. So yeah, we are still trying to and attempt to also uh, learn from the grassroots how they deal with this problem. But certainly it's a really big issue right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there, uh, Celeste, did you wanna speak to what you just wrote about and then we'll wrap it up? Well, I just wanted to say that um, this, this Ukraine war is probably, we're all hearing about it. It's the latest war that has come up and of course it has affected Europe. And so we're gonna hear about it all over the world. Unlike the, all the wars that are going on everywhere. Um, but I, I don't know if you have seen photos of or, or video of, of the men talking about this war, all these people that are trying to make, you know, talk peace or whatever, or Putin and Macron sit, sitting really far apart. War is a man-made product and it, it it's major casualties are always women and children. And it is a, a climate disaster as well. So these, I mean, I, I just don't even have the words, uh, but we need to start, we need to recognize that we need more women out there making decisions um, because I think that women will bring an end to wars. Men don't have had many opportunities to end the cycle, the continuous cycle of war and they haven't done it. So I don't know how to do it, but that's our next frontier, I think. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a very powerful way to end this uh, webinar right now um, with those words, so thank you. Um, I, I'm going to turn it now to um, Ingrid Daniels, uh, former president of WFMH to, to have some closing remarks, but I want to just mention that there's going to be a link at the very end for doing feedback on this webinar. We really would appreciate, it's a very quick uh, survey um, if you would respond to that, I'll put that up in the end. And if I can figure out how to do it, I'll do it in the chat as well. So just uh, uh, let me turn this over to Ingrid. Thank you so much, Ricky. Good day, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be here and I'm honored to have been part of this uh, webinar today. Um, the presenters were just so spot on and eloquent in presenting to us the challenges that we face. Connie, you started off and your title was, are you okay living with climate change? And I think it was answered by Kriti who said that climate change is a major global health threat to the world. So we're definitely not okay living with climate change. We know that it is one of the greatest challenges of our time and its consequences for mental health, specifically the mental health of women, children, vulnerable groups, requires our very focused attention and strategic interventions. It is a major social and ecological determinant for mental health. An article by Kahan Koni, it's all, the impact of climate change on mental health, a systemic descriptive review stated that the effects of climate change can be direct or indirect, short-term or long-term. In a number of papers that they presented, they indicated that there are new terms in mental health coming to the fore, such as eco-anxiety, eco-guilt, eco-psychology, ecological grief, biospheric concerns. But in addition, we know that the exposure to extreme and prolonged weather-related events have devastating consequences for the mental health of large populations of women and children and vulnerable groups. Post-traumatic stress, 
depression, anxiety, all the common mental disorders. And this can even be transmitted to later generations. So I think you would agree that we need to keep the spotlight on the effects of climate change on women, children, and these vulnerable groups. And as was said, not forgetting the shadow pandemics of gender-based violence, the consequences of COVID-19 on women and children, again, and vulnerable groups, and the wars across the world. We need to ensure that there are creative health emergency and disaster risk management plans, which includes focused attention on prevention and intervention methods that considers and prioritizes the needs of women, children, and vulnerable groups. Celeste, I think there was an invitation to all of us. It requires unlikely environmental activists. And I think we all of that. To ensure that we continue to advocate that our voices are heard loud and clear, that we talk about prevention, we talk about actions to reduce the devastating impact that climate change has had. And we've heard Priti's personal story and there are many of those. We need to ensure that we remain vocal as women and as sometimes unlikely environmental activists and mental health activists. And I think it was Connie who said, we need to be ahead of the disaster. And it is not only the climate change, disasters that we've seen over time, but the disaster it has for the mental health of women, children, and vulnerable groups. It was Mary Robertson who said, if we took away barriers to women's leadership, we would solve climate change problems a lot faster. I thank you. Ricky, unmute. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and uh, show you um, the link here. And the last uh, screen, I, I did put it into the chat. And then here's the final screen and let me move this over. Um, if you'd like to be informed of future webinars and activities, please contact Nancy Wallace. Nancy gave the um, opening remarks. Uh, here is her link, her phone number, and we want you, we need you to be part of the global mental health movement for change and to increase our presence around the world, to strengthen our collective voices, as everyone was saying. So become a member of WFMH. If you already are a member, figure out how to get more involved. If you're interested in the women's mental health section, you can let Nancy know that as well. But overall, I just want to thank everyone. I'm going to um, just go back and forth between, again, here's the link that's in the chat. Um, and then we're gonna just end with this uh, slide with Nancy. And we are right on time. Uh, I'd like to wish you all a great day and thank you so much to our panelists. And I'm going to just go back and end with this slide. So thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye, and thank you. Bye, everyone.